When I return to the ravine in early May, I find that a lot of logging has been done and that new home construction and other development are underway. I decide to relocate to a site nine miles from here where in 2006 a young man had seen a Sasquatch running through the woods. I find many suggestive stick structures. I also find trees whose bark has been removed. One night, I set up my thermal camera and audio recorder, and then I go back home. The recorder picks up a characteristic form of Sasquatch communication, which goes on continuously, much more often than I've reproduced here, until at least the middle of the night, when my battery dies. For all this extremely nearby knocking, nothing appears on the footage except what I assume to be a bobcat. I'll try hitting down here. I am beginning to let a tiny apprentice become involved. Okay, that's easy. I think good, honey. I think this might be a it might be a Sasquatch track right here. See there? where he puts his big foot in the mud and makes a track. It might be. It's pretty big, see? See, honey, this might be where the, where the heel went. And that, and that's the, that's the mid-tarsal hinge, I think. You see it goes up and down, because their, their, their feet bend like this. Our, our feet don't do that, but their feet bend like that. This might be one right here. See, it's really big. It might just be the front part of the foot. That's because it's a lot wider than Daddy's foot, right? Mm -hmm. Step in it, Daddy. See? Hmm. hmm. Or maybe they was walking like this. This line of tracks continues for 85 feet before veering off into the woods where I can't follow it. Like this one, just an inch or two longer than mine. I'm size 12. And directly in front of it, pretty directly in front of it, is another one. And uh, the stride is a lot longer than mine. So my natural stride is there. And I have, to, I have to really stretch to get there. And then up here are pretty clear and really wide impression. I think that the Sasquatches live up there. Up there? Whoa. I pan around with the thermal camera, but there is no eyepiece on this unit, so I can't see what's in front of me or review the footage until the next day. Hello? Holy smokes. That was scary. At dawn comes the realization of just how close this tree came to me, just six and a half feet away.
Of all the hundreds of trees within earshot, it's just this one that came down. When I do review the footage, I can make out what may be a figure, stock still on its hands and knees. Of course, an organism would usually appear brighter on thermal, but I can't judge the distance, and it may be that this one was behind a screen of leaves. If I had heard anything and could see more than three feet in front of me that night, I would have kept the camera trained on him until he moved. If this is the bottom of his left foot that we are looking at, it does appear a bit brighter, which would make sense given the lack of hair cover. About ten months earlier, while a guest at the home of one of the contributors to my book, Impossible Visits, where she had experienced many sightings both by day and by night, I filmed an apparent arm reaching out from behind a debris pile. That time, too, frustratingly, I didn't know what I had until I was able to review the footage later. You can actually see the hand cupping the end of this board. From a slightly different angle, and a few minutes later, we can see a closed fist and the extra heat emanating from that part of the body where there is less hair cover. This reminds me of the possible left foot from September 15th of this year.